Okay, welcome guys. Uh, in this session, we will be discussing about the basics of the carbohydrate. How, uh, what is carbohydrate? What are the various types of carbohydrate? We have the classification part of the carbohydrate. So, if we go with the little meaning of the carbohydrate, the word carbohydrate, what it says to us is that they are basically the hydrated carbon chains. Hydrated carbon chain. Now, this is the little meaning that we can figure out from the word carbohydrate. Right. So, hydrated means we are going to add water. Uh, water means H2O. Either we can write like H2O or we can write HOH. That is also H2O. HOH that is H2O only. So, we are going to have the hydration part that is the HOH that is H2O. Along with that, we are going to have a carbon chain. Now, to make a carbohydrate, we need to add we need to add one functional group. We need to add one functional group. There are two options available with us. Either we can use aldehyde as our functional group, that is CHO, or we can use C double bond O, that is the keto group. So either we can use the aldehyde or the keto group. So basically, there are three constituents of the carbohydrate that we have got. One is the the hydration part then is the carbon chain and either of them the aldehyde or the keto we are going to use right, to make a carbohydrate so let's make the smallest possible carbohydrate and from that we will uh, we will derive the actual definition of the carbohydrate the smallest possible carbohydrate we will use i one time we will use the aldehyde group and the next time we will use the keto group so let's let's make the smallest possible carbohydrate with one uh, each of them so if i want to make with the aldehyde group the molecule will look like this this is the aldehyde group then is the carbon chain is the carbon chain and now we need to add the the hydration part that is hoh so you can see that this is the smallest possible carbohydrate that we could have figured out when we are using aldehyde as a functional group in the same way if i use the keto group and i want to make the smallest possible carbohydrate this is the keto group here are the, the carbons and the hydration so uh, these are the these are the smallest possible carbohydrate we have if you see that how many carbons are there in each of these one two three one two three there are three carbons in each of them we have three carbons so the point is that the smallest possible carbohydrate the smallest possible carbohydrate will have how many carbons three carbons the name of this molecule is glyceraldehyde and this is dihydroxyacetone These are the, the smallest possible carbohydrates. These are the smallest possible carbohydrates, glyceraldehyde and the dihydroxyacetone. So, the, the smallest possible carbohydrates will have how many carbons? 3 carbons. Less than that, we cannot make a carbohydrate. The minimum requirement to make a carbohydrate will be a triose, means it will have at least of 3 carbons. It will be either glyceraldehyde or the dihydroxyacetone. Now, once I am saying that these are the smallest possible carbohydrates, either by using the aldehyde group or the keto group. Let's derive the definition of carbohydrate by looking at these molecules. What you can see in each of them, in each of them, if I say that how many hydroxyl groups are there? If you see the glyceraldehyde, there is one and two, there are two hydroxyl groups. If you see the dihydroxyacetone, again there are two hydroxyl groups are there, right? So, minimum, minimum of more than one hydroxyl group has to be there. So, I can say what is carbohydrate, what is carbohydrate is, carbohydrate is basically polyhydric alcohols, right. So, let us write down polyhydric, so basically the polyhydric uh, derivative of, polyhydric derivative with either the aldehyde group, by either the aldehyde group or the keto group that is C double bond O. So, what is carbohydrate is basically it is a polyhydric derivative with either aldehyde or the keto group means more than one alcohol is going to be there polyhydric alcohol either with aldehyde or the keto group that is going to be there. Now, once we are clear with the basic definition of carbohydrate that to make the carbohydrate we are going to have these basic requirements. Let's see the classification of carbohydrate. 
सो टू अंडरस्टैंड द क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ कार्बोहाइड्रेट क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ कार्बोहाइड्रेट वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट वॉट आर द सब कैटेगरीज द सब कैटेगरीज आर सच इज मोनोसेकेरेड डाइसेकेरेड ओलिगोसेकेरेड एंड द पोलिसकेरेड these are the sub categories that we need to discuss so starting with the first one that is the monosaccharide the monosaccharide what is monosaccharide is see monosaccharide is the building block to make any type of carbohydrate whether you want to make disaccharide oligosaccharide polysaccharide you will be requiring monosaccharide means what that let's say i want to make disaccharide what i will do is i will take two monosaccharide and will join with the glycosidic bond if i want to make oligosaccharide i will take 3 to 10 monosaccharide will join them will be oligosaccharide if more than 10 monosaccharides are there it is will called as polysaccharide so ultimately the monosaccharide is going to come in each of the unit so uh, the monosaccharide is the building block monosaccharide is the building block of carbohydrate you want to make any type of any type of carbohydrate you will be requiring monosaccharide when it comes to the formula there is a universal formula for monosaccharide and the universal formula is like cm h2o n you just put the value of the carbon numbers n here is the number of carbons number of carbon in the monosaccharide so we just put the value of n and we'll get the formula say for example glucose six carbon molecule so the n will be six so you put the value of six the formula comes out to be c6 h12o6 so this is how it is done now let's see the examples of monosaccharide example of monosaccharide now when it comes to example when it comes to example of monosaccharide first we need to understand that the the monosaccharide can be divided into several types depending that how many carbons are there right so to make a smallest possible carbohydrate or to make a smallest possible monosaccharide how many carbons should be there just now we have discussed that in the beginning that smallest possible smallest possible carbohydrate will have how many carbons you can see in the uh, structure it is going to have three carbons right so the smallest possible monosaccharide the smallest possible monosaccharide is going to be a triose is going to be a triose now this triose can be made with the help of aldehyde group or we can make with the keto group we can use any of the one as a functional group so to make any carbohydrate either you are going to use a keto group or a aldehyde group so let's say i want to make a monosaccharide which is consisting of total of three carbons either with the aldehyde group or the keto group so if i am using aldehyde as a functional group and making a triose the molecule name will be glyceraldehyde the molecule name will be glyceraldehyde if i am using the keto group if i am using the keto group the, the, the name of the molecule is going to be dihydroxyacetone so it will be dihydroxyacetone in the same way if i want to make tetrose tetrose means four carbon four carbon with the aldehyde as a functional group the mother name of the molecule is erythrose keto group it is erythrulose erythrose erythrulose if i want to make five carbon a monosaccharide that is pentose then it is uh, the example with aldehyde group is say for example xylose or ribose they are the five carbon monosaccharide with aldehyde as a functional group so the keto version will be xylulose ribulose these are the keto version in the same way if i want to make six carbon monosaccharide that is hexose with the aldehyde as a functional group that is the commonest one that is the glucose in the same way if i want to make a hexose with keto group the molecule that i am going to make is going to be called as fructose so this is how the the various types of monosaccharide will be made now we have discussed isomerism in a separate video if you have seen that video you would have understood that the glucose the mannose the galactose all are 
type of isomer they are epimer of one another means how you make glucose to mannose you just rotate the hoh of the glucose at the carbon number 2 how you make glucose to galactose you rotate the hoh at the carbon number 4 means glucose mannose glucose uh, galactose they are exactly same just the hoh is rotated so if i ask you that if i want to place the mannose or galactose where we are going to place in this table mannose is a 6 carbon with aldehyde as a functional group as well as galactose is also a 6 carbon sugar with aldehyde as a functional group right so whether it is glucose mannose or galactose all are having 6 carbon and aldehyde as a functional group so this table is per se not important for the question but it is very important for the understanding of the metabolism so because when i say galactose meta metabolism what should come in your mind is galactose is a 6 carbon sugar it is having aldehyde as a functional group so you know the composition then it is the metabolism is going to be easy right and the clinical correlation is also going to be easy once we know the composition this is how uh, it is to be done now if i ask you that what is the formula what is the formula for these molecules so because we have the universal formula we have the universal formula that is with the name of cn h2on so if they ask the triose whether it is glyceraldehyde dihydroxyacetone what will be the formula the formula comes out to be c3h6o3 in the same way tetrose the formula will be c4h8o4 pentose will be c5h10o5 and hexose will be c6h12o6 so so these are the formulas that are going to be there for the triose tetrose pentose and hexose right now once we are clear with this uh, there is a uh, next version of monosaccharide that we can say and that is called as something called as derived sugars let's yes, write down this point derived sugar now what is the meaning of derived sugar derived sugar if i say in simple words derived sugar means if you take a monosaccharide and you add a extra functional group if you add any extra group or any molecule you add on the monosaccharide that combination is going to be called as derived sugar monosaccharide means maybe glucose galactose fructose you take any of them and you add anything extra apart on that that is called as derived sugar right now monosaccharide is represented by cn h2o n but derived sugar will not be represented by this formula because you have added something extra on that monosaccharide so that is not going to be represented by that formula so i can say derived sugar is not represented by not represented by cn h2o n we cannot represent the derived sugar by this formula so if i give you example that will make more sense to you let's say the example of derived sugar can be amino sugar amino sugar now what is amino sugar is you are going to have the monosaccharide and the extra thing that you are going to get is the amino group we are going to add the amino group on that that is called as amino sugar so the example can be if you take glucose and you add the amino group that will be glucosamine that on the glucose we have added the amino group or we can add on galactose so it will be galactosamine so it can be glucosamine galactosamine and so on this is the first example the second example is glycosides the second example of derived sugar is glycoside now what is glycoside is if i take the monosaccharide and on that monosaccharide if we add the phenol group if we add the phenol group that is called as glycoside that is called as glycoside the example of glycosides are you may be knowing from pharmacology that is such as cardiac glycosides cardiac glycoside amino glycoside pyromycin these are the example of the glycoside then the third one is the alcohol sugar alcohol sugar now what is alcohol sugar is if you have the monosaccharide and if you add additional hydroxyl group additional hydroxyl group then it is called as alcohol sugar hydroxyl group means oh if you add additional hydroxyl group that is called as the alcohol sugar uh, let's see the example if i take glucose and i add the additional hydroxyl group that i can do 
the same can be done for mannose we can add the additional hydroxyl group the same can be done with the galactose same additional hydroxyl group can be added. so if you add a hydroxyl group on galactose that is called as galcitol if we add additional hydroxyl group on mannose that is called as mannitol and if we add additional hydroxyl group on glucose that is called as uh, that is not called as glucitol that is called as sorbitol that is called as sorbitol that is some in some books it is written as glucitol also but uh, that is not very commonly used what we commonly use is sorbitol so the example of alcohol sugars can be sorbitol mannitol or galcitol these are the example of alcohol sugar now what are the clinical implication of knowing all these molecules the clinical clinical implication i will start one by one starting with the first one that is the sorbitol right what is the use of knowing sorbitol and the mannitol and the galcitol so put the things in this way that let's say there is a patient of diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus means the blood sugar will be on the higher side let's say this is the representation of the blood vessel i can say that the the blood glucose is going to be on the higher side if a patient of diabetes is there now this glucose because there is extra glucose always present in the blood it might happen that it will add with the additional hydroxyl group in the blood and it will convert into a molecule that is with the name of sorbitol sorbitol these sorbitol molecules will be there in the blood and these sorbitol molecule will travel all the way via blood and will reach in the eye will reach in the eye and these sorbitol molecules may deposit in the lens of the eye sorbitol deposits in the lens of the eye if the sorbitol molecule deposit in the lens of eye then the lens will be opaque the lens will be opaque and once the lens will be opaque that is called as the cataract so the cataract that we are talking about that is happening in the a uh, diabetes patient because of the accumulation of the sorbitol this is called as snow flag cataract snow flag cataract so the question to be remembered is snow flag cataract occurs in which individual snow flag cataract is seen in diabetes mellitus and it is due to accumulation of which molecule is it the glucose which is accumulating or it is the sorbitol the answer will be sorbitol it is not the glucose which is accumulating in the snow flag cataract it is the 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 sorbitol molecule normally uh, cataract takes time to develop right but snow flag cataract is the cataract which develops overnight can develop overnight it is the fastest cataract to develop means the person is diabetic uh, went to bed completely fine the vision was completely fine the next day morning he when he will wake up he might have the uh, the blurry vision may be there right he is not able to see clearly the reason may be he has developed the snow flag cataract it is so fast to that it, that it can develop overnight then the the second clinical correlation that we need to understand and that is with the respect of mannitol so we have we have we have written three alcohol sugars the sorbitol mannitol and galcitol we are discussing the clinical implication of each of them so first we have discussed about the sorbitol part now i am talking about the the mannitol part see the mannitol is basically is a pharmacological agent mannitol is used in the treatment of intracranial tension means whenever there is increase in the icp intracranial pressure whenever it is raised it is called as the ict means intracranial tension and to decrease the intracranial pressure we use the mannitol so mannitol is used used in the treatment of raised intracranial pressure raised intracranial pressure so whenever we have the raised intracranial pressure we use the mannitol we use the mannitol but there is one condition where we have raised intracranial pressure despite that mannitol is contraindicated and that is very important to know and that is extra dural hemorrhage so mannitol is contraindicated in extra dural hemorrhage is contraindicated in extra dural hemorrhage despite that there is raised intracranial tension we will use the different drugs we will use the surgical modality but we cannot use the mannitol at that moment when there is extra dural hemorrhage 
so mannitol can be used in subdural hemorrhage can be used in the inter uh, subdural hemorrhage can be used in the intracerebral hemorrhage but it cannot be used in the extradural hemorrhage it cannot be used in the extradural hemorrhage so how we are going to find out whether the patient is having extradural or the subdural hemorrhage right so whenever a patient comes to you whenever a patient comes to you let's say there is you are sitting in the emergency room and a patient comes to you with road traffic accident let's say there is a patient of patient of rt road traffic accident he has got a head injury he has got a head injury and right now once a patient comes to you head injury the first thing that you are going to do in the emergency room is you will go for a ct scan of the brain so the first thing that you are going to do is the ncct known contrast ct of the brain this is the first thing to be ordered for this particular patient now when you do the ct you can find you can have the several findings one is on the ct scan let's say this is the ct scan film of the skull skull counter is visible now here you can see that there is accumulation of the blood in this particular area and it is looking like this so i can say there is a uh, bleeding that occurred inside the brain and that is increasing the pressure so this is one type of bleeding that you can get this is the one of the pattern that you can get the white color of blood that will be accumulated here the another type of ct scan film that you might get in a patient of road traffic accident which which might look like this which might look like this so i have made two types of hemorrhages the first type of hemorrhage where you can see that it is a bi convex it is a bi convex hemorrhage means from the both of the side it is convex in nature bi convex hemorrhage bi convex fibro you can see bi convex right like this like a lens this bi convex here you can see it is concave convex concave convex like this like a moon like a moon right so if it is bi convex it is suggestive of extra dural hemorrhage it is called as extra dural hemorrhage so just looking at the ct scan you should be able to make a diagnosis whether it is extra dural or is it subdural subdural hemorrhage so if it is concave or convex it is going to be a subdural hemorrhage and for that subdural mannitol can be used mannitol can be used but in extra dural extra dural mannitol is contraindicated mannitol is contraindicated so you should be able to identify that which because of the head injury various types of blood vessel can rupture if the middle meningeal artery ruptures it will lead to extra dural hemorrhage so uh, why extra dural hemorrhage occurs it is due to rupture of due to rupture of you can see you can write in this flow chart here itself that due to rupture of middle meningeal artery if the middle meningeal artery ruptures then we are going to have the extra dural hemorrhage and if the cross bridging veins ruptures then it is going to be subdural hemorrhage due to rupture of cross bridging veins so if the cross bridging vein will rupture it will lead to subdural hemorrhage that is called as sdh if it is a middle vein artery if it breaks down if it ruptures it will lead to extra dural hemorrhage so looking at that we should have to find out that which treatment modality that we are going to go with if it is extra dural then the only thing that you are left with is going to go for a surgical decompression we cannot use mannitol we can not go with that so the only thing that you can do for extra dural hemorrhage is the surgical decompression whereas in the the subdural part there is concave convex you can use mannitol you can do surgical decompression if required but you can use the mannitol at the, the beginning part in the treatment line so this is all about the the monosaccharide part this is all about the monosaccharide part. now coming to the disaccharide the second category of the carbohydrate that is the disaccharide now what is the meaning of disaccharide is there is basically two monosaccharide will join and will make the disaccharide 
टू यूनिट्स ऑफ मोनोसेग्राइड जॉइंट्स वाय टू मोन यूनिट्स ऑफ मोनोसेग्राइड जॉइंट्स वाय द ग्लाइकोसिडिक बॉन्ड टू यूनिट्स विल जॉइंट्स वाय द ग्लाइकोसिडिक बॉन्ड एंड विल मेक द डाइसेक्राइड विल मेक द डाइसेक्राइड सो लेट्स सी द एग्जाम्पल द एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ डाइसेक्राइड आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट so starting with the first one the first example of disaccharide it is maltose so how the maltose is made how the maltose is made what we do is we take two glucose molecule glucose is a monosaccharide we take two glucose molecule and we join these two glucose molecule via the glycosidic bond now to join them what we do is the glucose that we are taking it is in the alpha form so i am taking alpha 2 molecules of glucose which are in the alpha form in the in the video of isomerism we have discussed what is alpha and beta denotes alpha and beta denotes the enomerism and enomers are made in the ring structure so basically if i say alpha glucose means the glucose that we are talking about is in the ring structure is in the ring structure so if i make the diagram the diagram will look like this let's say this is the alpha glucose because alpha means Uh, it is going to be a ring structure so this is the alpha glucose and here is the alpha glucose so these are the two alpha glucose molecule we are going to clump together here will be the hoh and so on here also if i give the carbon numbers then what you can appreciate is here is the carbon number 1 because we start from the functional group carbon number 2 3 4 5 and 6 these are the six carbons of the glucose here also we will have the six carbon carbon number 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 these are the six carbon of the glucose now we are going to make a glycosidic bond in between so how the glycosidic bond is made the glycosidic bond is made between the carbon number 1 and the carbon number 4 so if they ask that this is the glycosidic bond that we understood that this is the glycosidic bond but if they ask that what is the direction the direction comes out to be the direction comes out to be it is alpha 1 uniting with the alpha 4 this is the direction of bond alpha 1 uniting with the alpha 4 this is the direction of bond that is coming out to be so every time we are not going to make the diagram if i say alpha 1 alpha 1 it is should be self understood that the first glucose is in the alpha form it is uniting with the second glucose first carbon with the alpha form if i say alpha 1 alpha 1 if i say alpha 1 uh, beta 1 uh, then the first glucose is in the alpha form the second glucose is in the beta form and we are uniting in the third so here it is alpha 1 alpha 4 means that the first carbon is uniting with the fourth carbon so it is called as alpha 1 alpha 4 this is maltose now coming to the the second one the second example is lactose lactose is also referred as milk sugar milk sugar what is the composition the composition is it is the beta galactose unite with the beta glucose beta galactose will unite with the beta glucose the direction of the bond is beta 1 beta 4 means the the first carbon is going to unite with the fourth carbon beta 1 beta 4 let's see the third example that is lactulose see the third example that is lactulose lactulose is basically it is made up of galactose with fructose so it is galactose clubbing with the fructose when it comes to the direction of bond the galactose in the alpha form the fructose in the beta form so the direction of bond is alpha 1 beta 4 the direction of bond is alpha 1 beta 4 this is the direction of the bond in the molecule lactulose then the the fourth example is the sucrose 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 is basically glucose clubbing with the fructose glucose clubbing with the fructose the direction of bond is alpha 1 beta 2 means the glucose is in the alpha form fructose in the beta form alpha beta i hope you remember when we have discussed in the lecture of isomerism alpha and beta is you rotate the hoh on the the carbon number 1 right 
so you if the hydrogen is on the upper side it's alpha if hydrogen is on the lower side it's beta then uh, the last is the three halos that is glucose uniting with glucose and the direction of bond is alpha 1 alpha 4 alpha 1 alpha 4 so these are the various types of the disaccharide that we have we do not have to remember all the direction i am just highlighting the important ones that direction that you should remember you need to remember the composition for all the disaccharide that is fine but the direction is not important for all what are the direction that you must remember is the maltose is alpha 1 alpha 4 and the lactose is beta 1 beta 4 these are the two important directions that you must remember remaining if you can remember very good if not that will also fine but you should know that what is the composition of each of the disaccharide this lactulose is also uh, sorry this uh, sucrose is also called as cane sugar sucrose is also called as cane sugar what is the use of lactulose what is the use of lactulose let's write down this point this is a clinical implication of the lactulose that lactulose is a osmotic laxative so someone is suffering from constipation lactulose can be given the lactulose will go in the intestine and it will increase the it will increase the osmolarity in the lumen of the intestine so the water will be pulled inside the lumen of the intestine and that is going to increase the bulk of the stool and that is going to increase the liquidity of the stool so the stool will be easily passed so someone suffering from constipation the lactulose syrup lactulose are available that lactulose is used in uh, used to do the osmotic uh, work as an osmotic laxative osmotic laxative and uh, lactulose is also used in also used in in a patient of hepatic encephalopathy this is also going to work in the patient of hepatic encephalopathy see what is hepatic encephalopathy is basically do in uh, in those individuals where the liver is compromised let's say there is some there is someone who is chronic alcoholic underwent cirrhosis now the liver is not working then what happens is the ammonia is unable to convert into urea the ammonia is going to accumulate and that is going to lead to encephalopathy the person will be lethargic will go into coma so this ammonia is also generated by the commensal bacteria and we do not want the commensal bacteria to grow more and to grow more ammonia that will worsen the situation so what we do is we give this lactulose to the patient so this lactulose will lead to diarrhea the 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 ammonia uh, productive uh, the, the the bacteria which is producing the ammonia that will be washed out from the lumen and so the ammonia production will be decreased this is one of the way by which the lactulose works in the hepatic encephalopathy now having said that these are the various examples of the uh, the disaccharide now this disaccharide which we have discussed whatever examples we have discussed this disaccharide can be bifurcated into two types let's see what are the types of disaccharide we have disaccharide is further divided into two subcategories we further divided into two subcategories what are the two subcategories is one is called as the reducing sugar and the non reducing sugar reducing sugar and the non reducing sugar let's understand what is the concept behind these two reducing and the non reducing sugar reducing sugar means reducing sugar means free functional group present reducing sugar means free functional group present that is called as reducing and if in a disaccharide functional group is free functional group is not present means both the functional group because in disaccharide we have two monosaccharides each monosaccharide has one functional group so if both the functional group is utilized in the formation of bond then that is called as non reducing type of disaccharide if only one functional group is utilized one is still free if free is present then we'll say it is reducing if both functional group both functional group are utilized in the formation of in the formation of glycosidic bond means no free functional group present means no free functional group if this is the situation that there is no free functional group 
then we are going to say that it is non-reducing. So if the function group is present, it is the reducing one. If it is not present, it is non-reducing. So the let's understand it in more detail. If I give you a diagrammatic representation, that is going to give you more idea that what is the meaning of free functional group, right? What is the meaning of free functional group present, not present? So just giving you a brief idea, we have made the structure of Waltos. If I make the structure of Waltos again, let's say if I make the structure of Waltos again. What we have written in maltose is, maltose is basically made up of, maltose is a disaccharide is made up of alpha glucose uniting with the another alpha glucose. And the direction of bond was alpha 1, alpha 4. This was the direction of bond. Alpha 1, alpha 4. So, if I make the structure of the maltose, this is the first alpha glucose in the ring structure. And here is the second alpha glucose. We always start the carbon numbering from the functional group. So, let's say here is the carbon number 1, carbon number 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. These are the 6 carbons that we have. In the same way, here also we are going to have the 6 carbons. 1, 2 and 6. These are the 6 carbons. If I want to make the glycosidic bond, it is going to be alpha 1, alpha 4. So, the direction of bond will be like this. Now, what you can see is, we always start the carbon numbering from the functional group. That is the carbon number 1. So, here you can easily appreciate that this carbon number 1 is still free. It is free. Means, I can say the functional group is free. Right? If the free functional group is present, then it is called as reducing group. It is called as reducing sugar. Right. If both the functional group are utilized in the formation of bond, then it will be called as non-reducing. So, what are the examples of non-reducing that is more important for us? The example of non-reducing sugars are sucrose and trehalose. Sucrose and trehalose are the example of non-reducing sugar. If both are given in the option, we need to select sucrose as a choice because Tree halose is not found in humans. Tree halose is not found in humans. That is there in the plants. That is also non-reducing. But if they are asking the question that which of the non-reducing is found in humans and both are option is given, then you have to select the sucrose. So now by that we have understood that which are the reducing, which are the non-reducing. Non-reducing are sucrose and tree halose. Remaining all are remaining all are reducing. So the example of if I write the example of the reducing ones, one I have already explained that is maltose. Then I can say it is lactose, lactulose. They all are reducing sugar. Non-reducing are the sucrose and trihalose. Now, there is one more test that we have by which we can differentiate whether it is the reducing sugar or non-reducing sugar. And that is called as Benedict test. So, let's write on this point. This is clinically important that if you want to detect whether the, the if let's say there is a patient to whom uh, the sugar is coming in the urine and you want to detect whether it's a reducing sugar that is coming or non-reducing sugar that is coming. So, what we can do is a Benedict test. So, let's write on this point that Benedict test is done to detect reduce, reducing sugar. Is done to detect So, by Benedict test, we can easily differentiate whether the sugar is reducing or non-reducing. We can easily differentiate whether the sugar is reducing or non-reducing by the Benedict test. Then the, then the third one, the third subcategory of the carbohydrate is the oligosaccharide. Oligosaccharide. Let's understand the points regarding oligosaccharide. Oligosaccharide means there are going to be 3 to 10 monosaccharide units are going to be there. Right? Oligosaccharide means 3 to 10 monosaccharide units are present. There will be 3 to 10 monosaccharide units are going to be there. They are going to be linked by again the glycosidic bond. If they are only 2, it is disaccharide. If it is more than 2, up to 10, it is going to be oligosaccharide. Now, the point to be remembered for oligosaccharide is, see the oligosaccharides, usually they are not found free in the body. They are not found free in the body. What they do is, these oligosaccharides, either they are going to link with a protein. If an oligosaccharide link with a protein, that is called as 
ग्लाइकोप्रोटीन दैट इज कॉल्ड एज ग्लाइकोप्रोटीन ग्लाइको मीन्स द कार्बोहाइड्रेट पार्ट दैट इज ऑलिगोसेक्रेट एंड द प्रोटीन इज प्रोटीन इफ द ऑलिगोसेक्रेट यूनाइट्स विद अ लिपिड दैट इज कॉल्ड एज ग्लाइकोलिपिड दैट इज रेफर्ड एज ग्लाइकोलिपिड so this point should be clear that what should what will be the glycoprotein and what is glycolipid glycoprotein basically if the if the oligosaccharide unites with protein is called as glycoprotein if it is uniting with the, the lipid part is the glycolipid now this glycolipid is further divided into three subtypes it is further divided into three subtypes the n type of glycoprotein the o type of glycoprotein and the third one is the gpi glycoprotein there are three subtypes n o and gpi now what is the use of knowing these three see what is n type of glycoprotein means that the glyco is always carbohydrate and that is going to be oligosaccharide if you add the oligosaccharide on the protein where you are attaching based on that we have three subtype if you are attaching on the amino group if you are attaching on the amino group that is called as n type of glycoprotein means the oligosaccharide is attached on amino group if we add on the amino group that is called as the n type of glycoprotein what is o type if we add on the hydroxyl group hydroxyl means oh if you attach on the oh group of the amino acid if you attach the oligosaccharide on the oh group of the uh, of the uh, of the amino acid then it is called as the o type of glycoprotein so i can say oligosaccharide is attached on hydroxyl group of amino acid hydroxyl group is not found in all the amino acid it is there with the serine threonine and tyrosine so if the if they ask that o type of glycoprotein will be made with which type of amino acid it will be only three that can be there that is serine threonine and tyrosine because only these three have the alcohol group the hydroxyl group and among these the primarily the first two will have, will make the o type of glycoprotein now coming to the third one that is called as the gpi type of glycoprotein now what is gpi stands for gpi is basically glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol linked glycoprotein glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol linked glycoprotein means what gpa stands for glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol means there is going to be oligosaccharide there is going to be protein part and along with that there is something additional is also present and that is with the name of phosphatidyl inositol that is basically a molecule that is found in the membranes of the cell that is basically found in the cell membrane so what is gpi glycoprotein means there is going to be oligosaccharide there is going to be protein along with that there is going to be phosphatidyl inositol right so that is called as the uh, gpi linked glycoprotein now what is the use of uh, discussing all this what is the use of discussing all this is there is uh, two clinical correlations that we need to understand one is with the name of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria let's understand the pathophysiology of the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria If we talk about the pathophysiology of the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, what you are going to notice that normally what happens is when we go into a deep sleep, when we go into deep sleep, at that time there is decrease in the respiratory rate that occurs. Means around three a.m., four a.m. in midnight, the respiratory rate drops, and because of that, the CO two rises in our body, and because of CO two rise, because CO two is having acidic nature, so it will lead to acidosis. this is the normal phenomena that is happening with every day when we are in the deep sleep now this acidosis is uh, we can say is harmful for the rbc this acidosis is harmful for rbc uh, what happens is that uh, this acidosis can lead to 
can lead to hemolysis can lead to hemolysis means it can kill the rbc but it is prevented by it is prevented by cd59 and something called as dk accelerating factor so these are the protective two protective mechanism that we have cd59 and dk accelerating factor because of them the hemolysis does not occur can lead to hemolysis every one of us can have hemolysis in midnight whenever we are going to have the acidosis but it is routinely not happening the reason is because we are having the cd59 and the dk, DK accelerating factor now the point is if there is mutation in something called as pig a gene pig a mutation if there is mutation in pig a gene then what happens is that the gpi glycoprotein will not be formed gpi glycoprotein will not be formed gpi glycoprotein i told you what is gpi glycoprotein is a phosphatidyl inositol glycoprotein they will not be formed now this gpi glycoprotein is required for cd59 and dk accelerating factor cd59 and dk accelerating factor they require gpi glycoprotein for their functioning but now i am saying that because if there is a mutation in this gene this gpi glycoprotein is not going to be there if it is not going to be there the cd59 and the dk accelerating factor will not work will not work if it will not work then it will lead to hemolysis so it will lead to midnight hemolysis midnight hemolysis so the next day morning when the patient will wake up he will have hemoglobin urea and this entire condition is referred as the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea that in the midnight there was no one to protect the rbc from the acidosis from the hemolysis because the gpi glycoprotein was not there so the 59 and the dk accelerating factor was not able to work and for this uh, one of the investigation that can be done is the hems test hems test can be done to diagnose the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea and the uh, treatment for this is something called as eculizumab that is a monoclonal antibody that can be used for the treatment of uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea this is one thing that to be remembered for glycoprotein that glycoprotein is of three types is of three types this is what we have discussed n o and the gpi anchor the most important that is clinically the most important is the gpi anchor one now what are the other points to remember in glycoprotein what are the various molecules that that comes or that is found in the form of glycoprotein the examples of glycoprotein which molecules are found in the form of glycoprotein the examples are blood group antigen blood group antigen is a molecule that is found in the glycoprotein form it is not protein it is a glycoprotein means there is oligosaccharide is also there in the blood group antigen such as a antigen or the b antigen then is the immunoglobulin immunoglobulin means the antibody they are also example of glycoprotein so the entire discussion is started because i told that the oligosaccharide does not found free in the body does not found free in the body either it is going to unite with the lipid or unite with the protein if it is going to unite with the protein is called as glycoprotein if it unites with the lipid is called as glycolipid and these are the further clinical correlations that we should know the the next one the fourth sub category the fourth sub category that we are going to discuss is the polysaccharide what is the meaning of polysaccharide polysaccharide means more than 10 monosaccharides are going to be there right so polysaccharide means more than 10 monosaccharide units are there more than 10 monosaccharide units are there they are going to join and they are going to make the polysaccharide polysaccharide is also called as glycans polysaccharide is also called as glycans also called as glycans now depending on the monosaccharide unit the polysaccharide can be of two types means what 
For example, I want to make a polysaccharide means I have to add what? I have to add more than 10 monosaccharides. So what I do is say for example, I take glucose, 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 glucose more than 10 times. Glucose is a monosaccharide. I take more than 10 molecules of glucose and I will make a monosaccharide. Uh, I will make a polysaccharide. In the other way, I, what I can do is, I can take first one is glucose, the second one is different, the third one is again glucose, then fourth one is different and so on. I can take different different monosaccharide or I can take same monosaccharide. If I am using same monosaccharide, that is called as homo polysaccharide. It is called as homo polysaccharide or sometimes also referred as homo glycans. So homo glycans or the homo polysaccharide is same. What is homo polysaccharide is that the monosaccharide unit is same. All monosaccharide are same. If all monosaccharide are same, it is called as homo polysaccharide. If all are not same, means they are different from one another, that is called as heteropolysaccharide or the heteroglycate. Heteroglycate means all monosaccharide units are not same. All monosaccharide units are not same. If it is same, it is homoglycan, if not same, it is heteroglycan. So once we are clear with these two terms, what is homopolysaccharide or the heteropolysaccharide, now we are going to see the examples of that. 